Welcome to Day 28 of our study of the book of Ecclesiastes. The title of today's lesson is, The Way the Spirit Comes to the Bones in the Womb. Our verses for today are found in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way of the Spirit comes into the bones and the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning, sow your seed, and in evening, withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So, if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Algorithms, according to Wikipedia, is defined as such. In mathematics and computer science, an algorithm is a finite sequence of well-defined instructions, typically used to solve a class of specific problems or to perform a computation. Algorithms are used as specifications for performing calculations, data processing, automated reasoning, automated decision-making, and other tasks. In contrast, a heuristic is an, an approach to problem solving that may not be fully specified or may not guarantee correct or optimal results, especially in problem domains where there is no well-defined correct or optimal result. Now, let me tell you, I have no idea what that means, but this should make it a little easier to understand. Simplified, it means, as an effective method, an algorithm can be expressed within a finite amount of space and time, and in a well-defined formal language for calculating a function, starting from an initial state and initial input, perhaps empty, the instructions describe a computation that, when executed, proceeds through a finite number of well-defined successive states, eventually producing output and terminating at a final ending state. The transition from one state to the next is not necessarily deterministic. Some algorithms, known as randomized algorithms, incorporate random input. Oh, yes, now I get it. Now I know I'll never understand this. But computer people get it, and that's what's important. They write codes that determine algorithms that, in turn, help me find stuff on my search engine, my GPS, my social networking, and I'm guessing about anything that involves a computer. But the roots of algorithms go back to the ancient Babylonian and Egyptian mathematicians and became formalized under a man named Muhammad ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi, whose Latin name actually was translated algorithmi. In its simplest form, broken down so I can understand it, is a set of instructions that tells how something is to be done. The conversation now begins with the question little children ask. No, this is not about algorithms. They ask, how are babies made? Which leads the adult to begin, when two people love each other. And don't worry, that's as far as I'm going to go in that direction. I don't know of any adult that tells a child initially when asked that question that will then launch into the whole journey involved with the egg becoming fertilized. The part DNA plays and how each cell decides if it's going to be the heart, the foot, the brain, or some other part of the body. We don't know if that baby will have its father's features or its mother's. We can peer into the tiniest parts of the baby's development, but experts are still baffled by the complexity of it all. 
Interestingly enough, even PBS's Nova episode dedicated to the human development entitled it Life's Greatest Miracle in its November 20th, 2001 episode. We are now some 3,000 years into the future of Solomon's writing of the book of Ecclesiastes. Mankind has looked further into space than ever before. We have peered deeper into the subatomic level than ever before. We know the exact detail of every muscle, organ, enzyme, material, and more of what makes up the body. Yet, we cannot give those compounds life outside the natural process. We can't mix them up like we do making a cake and voila, out comes a baby. It is still true today what Solomon proclaimed millennia ago in Ecclesiastes 11 verse 5. As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in a womb of a woman with child. Therefore, the conclusion that follows is also true. So you do not know the work of God who makes everything. As the psalmist declares in Psalm 104, 24, O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And again in Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. The whole of chapter 11 of Ecclesiastes is leading us to trust in God Almighty in His omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and every other omni-adjective we can come up with that attempts to describe the immeasurable nature of God. It is simply beyond our ability to grasp, or for that matter, calculate the incalculable possibilities involved in fitting it all together. Solomon keeps telling this over and over in Ecclesiastes. In chapter 3 and verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And again in chapter 7, beginning in verse 23, All this I have tested by wisdom. I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? And yet again in chapter 8 and verse 17, Then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. And declares at the end in Ecclesiastes 12.12, my son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. As even Paul declares to the church at Rome in Romans 11, 33 and 34, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments, and how inscrutable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been His counselor? Solomon's writing is like the gentle waves that keep washing up to the shore. Each wave brings a little bit more of the ocean and moves a little bit more of the shore. Solomon keeps bringing to us more knowledge and with it a greater understanding of God and His ways. Yet there is a point at which we simply cannot grasp anymore. Just as the ocean can only go so far and no further, we are assured that God has created this world and sustains it in ways we can only imagine. In this life, God desires us to carry on and rejoice in all we do. There are caveats, however. In verse 8 of chapter 11, So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all, 
But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Now Solomon begins to bring this all into focus, and with it, the admonition to the young. Verses 9 and 10. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. He will continue this thought into chapter 12. For all the algorithms that are making choices for us in our everyday lives in ways we are not even aware of, they pale in comparison to the manifold wisdom of God. As the hymnist wrote, When this passing world is done, when has sunk yon glaring sun, when we stand with Christ on high, looking o'er life's history, then, Lord, shall I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. Do such thoughts fill you with wonder and awe of Almighty God? Lord willing, let's meet here again tomorrow for another lesson from the book of Ecclesiastes.